Hello and welcome back to ERU where we round up the biggest results and talking points from across European football. Joining me today it's Henry Hill, a morning treat for you. How are you Henry on this Monday morning? Uh, we were just saying it feels like spring is finally back uh, after such a lovely weekend and I got to bump into you Diggy in the park so <laughs> what more could a Football Daily employee want uh, than that? So yeah no great weekend how are you mate? Oh, it was good. It was good. Yeah, it was random bumping into you actually, because I haven't. I feel like I haven't because I've been in my house the whole time for the last <laughs> six months, pretty much, or last year. Uh, I haven't really bumped into anyone. But on that Saturday, I was went for some beers in the park and bumped into like three or four people in South London, which was a real, <laughs> real treat. But anyway, hopefully we've got a good show lined up for you guys today, and we are kicking off with our story of the week, which comes in from Los Blanco Senior Three, because Rafa Varane could be on the move, Henry. Yeah, I read about this in kind of the gossip columns doing transfer talk a few weeks ago and wasn't sure what I thought about it, but it does look like it's coming to fruition. Real Madrid look like they're going to seriously consider selling Rafael Varane this summer as the club can't get him to reach a new agreement over a contract which is set to expire in 2022. So they can't seem to get many of their centre-backs to sign Mm. on at late. AS claim, therefore, that Los Blancos are open to the idea of selling the Frenchman uh, for a bid in the region of £61 million. So not cheap at all. Um, As we said, this would leave quite a big hole in the 13-time European champions back line. The 27-year-old has made a massive 350 appearances for the club since signing from Lens in June 2011. So, yeah, he's been there a really long time, hasn't he? He's only 27 as well. Um, I think, obviously, Sergio Ramos looks like he could be on the move as well this summer. Uh, Spanish journalist Jose Pedrerol claiming there is no way back for the 34-year-olds over um, talks over new contract there. I read yesterday in Marca that apparently Zidane is absolutely fed up of taking questions about Ramos's future again. Sounds like a bit of a bail situation all over again, doesn't it? Uh-oh, um, yeah. But, I mean, you might think, so what, where, where does their defence go from here? Um, Obviously, it does look like David Alaba will be um, potentially will be signing. He announced obviously that he's leaving Bayern Munich at the end of the season, and we've always thought that Real Madrid were probably favourites uh, for his signature. However, uh, Christian Falk, one of the kind of respected transfer gossip journalists out there, um, he's now claimed that PSG have entered the race as well. Because remember, he wants four hundred thousand pounds a week, which could prove a sticking point for Real Madrid. I don't think it will prove a sticking point for PSG, and they certainly probably could use a centre-back too. So that could really throw a spanner in the works. But maybe, maybe this could push them towards giving Ramos the new deal that he really wants. Who knows? But, I mean, let's just look at Varane again. World Cup winner, 27 years old, £61 million. That's a big fee for a centre-back, certainly in this current climate. Doogie, where do you honestly think he could go? with that kind of expectation on his head. Yeah, well, it's a lot of money, as you say, but it does leave Real Madrid in a slightly sticky situation. Obviously, they've got Ed Militao, they've got Nacho, who's filled in uh, there across this season as well, but you don't want to lose Ramos and Varane in the same window. And unsurprisingly, there are a number of clubs interested in the Frenchman. He's played at least 40 games in four of the last six completed seasons for Real Madrid. And AS claim that Liverpool are interested, while Mark claim Man United, who are linked with him before he signed his contract in September 2017, his last contract that is, PSG, Juventus and Chelsea are also watching the situation. So unsurprisingly for a man of his quality and with his CV, uh, there's a lot of clubs around Europe. All the big boys are interested in. And while he's not been at his best this season, I probably wouldn't say he's been at his best really since that embarrassing against Man City in the Champions League last term. He's looked particularly shaky without Sergio Ramos this term. Um, and, and I mean, that's unsurprising. The whole Real Madrid backline has with his uh, without him. I think their win mm. percentage drops down about 60% with or without uh, Ramos. So he is that crucial. But still, Varane's stats are, are pretty promising. 2.1 tackles and interceptions per 90 with a 73% completion rate. Any Anywhere above 65% is really exceptional. 75% aerial dual win rate. And as I said, this is a bit of a down season for him. Very competent passer as well. Completes nearly 90% of his passes. Nearly four long balls a game. But he's not the most progressive passer. So for a side like Man United, who are looking to match Maguire's ball-playing abilities with someone who's potentially more robust than Lindelof, who can also pass the ball out from the back effectively, maybe not the best option. Only 3.2 passes into the final third per 90, whereas Maguire completes 5.6 this term. And he's also not the best at carrying the ball 
out of the defence either. Just 2.8 progressive carries, which are carries that go over 5 yards towards the opponent's goal, which is 8th in the Real Madrid squad. For, for context, someone who's excelled this season in the Premier League, Ruben Diaz, who's probably odds-on favourite for the Young Player of the Year award, even though I don't think it should go to him, because in my book <laughs> they should change it to under-21 players, not under-23 yeah. players. But anyway, that's a debate for another time. But Ruben Diaz completes 6.8 progressive carries per 90, compared to Varane's 2.8. So it does show that he's a slightly... So maybe maybe not the bravest on the ball compared to these sort of leading Premier League centre-backs at the moment, but still a phenomenal player when he's at his best and was exceptional during that World Cup alongside Samuel Mtiti. Mm -hmm. What he does have is excellent anticipation. I'd say that's probably his strongest point. He's completed 102 clearances this season, which is nearly the double of next best Casemiro in Real Madrid's squad and would rank 19th in the Premier League, despite playing for a side that averaged nearly 60% of the ball in La Liga. So... I'm not sure whether he's worth 70 million euros, to be totally honest. It kind of depends what situation the club is I, club is in. I feel like Chelsea, if you know, they're very keen to keep Thiago Silva, uh, but if they can't manage to complete that, I think he'd be a step up on Rudiger and particularly Christensen, although Rudiger did play very well against Man United yesterday. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of umming and ahhing. I feel like he's, mm. he's a great player, but I think that's slightly overpriced for a guy with one year left on his contract this summer. I mean, are you in agreement with, with me? there Henry? Um, yeah to a degree I think if we remember how much sort of Napoli have been asking for Khalidou Koulibaly over all these mm. years and he's I think two years older um, than Varane then I think obviously he is better value but 60 million is a lot of money for a sense back I, I mean I don't believe that will maybe be a starting figure. If we look at the kind of the money they let Region go and for maybe Hakimi, maybe they don't want to make True. those mistakes again. Maybe there is sort of a bit of leeway there to be had. And anything around the 50 million mark for a club like Liverpool, who maybe are desperate for a centre-back right now, or maybe Manchester United as well, who could definitely upgrade uh, certainly one aspect of their back line, then I think it could be a deal certainly worth making. Lots of experience, lots of titles. I think it's a great move. There we have it. Henry likes it. I'm not so sure, but we want your opinion. Get your thoughts in the comments down below and let's move on to our result of the week. For our result of the week, we could have gone to Germany with RB Leipzig after their stunning 2-0 comeback victory against Borussia Mönchengladbach. Have a look at our previous Continental Club to see our preview for that game. Kind of went exactly as we said. But we're going to <laughs> Spain after at Kid 7 toxic recommended Barcelona. Doogie, what happened there? Yeah, I mean, that was a hell of a win for Leipzig, to be fair. Shout out for them, coming back from 2-0 down to win 3-2. Magnificent stuff. But we wanted to cover Barcelona because they avenged that 2-0 semi-final first leg defeat to Sevilla in the Copa del Rey by beating them 2-0 away from home in the league on Saturday with goals from Usman Dembele and Leo Messi. Now, despite the odd shaky moment with Ter Stegen, uh, displaying <laughs> some sort of dodgy clearances and an Ednez Re offside goal, this was a commanding display from the Blaugrana, to be honest. They had 56% possession, nine shots with five on target to Sevilla's four and two, and XG had it at 1.6 to just 0 0.1. So Sevilla really not in this game whatsoever. Unsurprisingly, Leo Messi continued his magnificent form in 2021. He was central in it. He provided the assist for Dembele's opener and scored his 38th goal against Sevilla late on. Six more than he has managed against any other side. The Andalusians just simply must hate the sight of him now. He is now netted in eight La Liga matches in a row, 12 in total during that run. So eight La Liga matches, but 12 goals in those matches, if that makes sense, as well as providing two assists. And he's now three clear of Suarez in the race for the Golden Boot on 19. Now, since being humiliated 4-1 by PSG in the Champions League, and it was a humiliation, they were completely played off the park, Barca have drawn 1-1 against Cadiz, beat Elche 3-0 and Sevilla 2-0. They're now unbeaten in 15 league games, drawing just three of them. So their league form has actually been excellent. They just need to get, get it together in the Copa del Rey and just get out of the Champions League as soon as possible without too much of a humiliation. I don't think anyone really sees them overturning that. But, you know, stranger things have happened. Mm. They're now second in the table, a point ahead of Real Madrid, who play Real Sociedad tonight. And they're five behind Atleti, who have a game in hand. Atleti, of course, got that win last night with uh, João Felix scoring a magnificent goal. But, Henry, what does this mean for Sevilla? Yeah, another disappointing display for Julian Lopetegui's side against a big club, I should say. And this brings an end to an end a 10-game unbeaten streak in domestic competition. Remember, we... Uh, followed them after that Champions League defeat to Borussia Dortmund and it was slightly strange considering how dominant they've been. Mm. Um, but once again, when it really matters, maybe just coming a bit short. They might feel slightly aggrieved though. Uh, the ball ricocheted off 
uh, Longley onto his hand in the build-up to the first goal. It would have been a harsh decision, to be fair. And then Bono saved Messi's shot, only for it to fall kindly back to him for the second. Can't take anything away from uh, the build-up to that goal, though, from Messi. And like I said, they'd be disappointed to come off second best so easily and concede two goals. They'd only conceded 18 league goals in 24 games to date in the league. So uh, the only club better than that, Atletico Madrid, Manchester City, Lille and PSG in Europe's top five leagues so far. And I think Bono hadn't conceded a goal in about six games going into this match. So he'll be annoyed okay. to see that streak go too. And this puts more pressure on their semi-final second leg against Barcelona at the new camp on Wednesday as they seek their first domestic trophy since 2010. If you think they've won four in the Europa League in that time, but they haven't been able to get it over the line in Spain. Teams like Valencia have all won the Copa del Rey. Let's see if Sevilla can join them there. But if we go back to Barcelona, the key performers, Jordi Alba, irrepressible. Does he ever get too old? I'm not quite sure, but he <laughs> played on the he played really well on the left of Coman's 3-1-4-2 formation. Get their seven tackles and interceptions, one dribble, 88% passing actually, one key pass. You consider the kind of more attacking role he's playing there to be so consistent and find his man, it's so impressive. But of course, man of the match, who else could it possibly be? Lionel Messi. <laughs> Three tackles and interceptions. I was, I was watching the highlights, I always found it funny when they said, ah, oh, the, uh, the man of the match, Lionel Messi. It's like, of course he's the man of the match. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Seven dribbles, 90% passing accuracy, one key pass, four shots, one assist, and one goal since the start of 2021. He's just playing unbelievably. He's averaging a goal contribution every 69 minutes. Now has 23 goals, six assists in, and in 28 league and European games. Games this term. What on earth does he do of all those man of the match trophies? I honestly don't know. Um, but Doogie, I mean, Barcelona, one week we're not quite sure. The next week it looks like they're revived again. It certainly looks like herman has got them all pushing in the direction. Where, like, How far do you think their season can really go? It's a difficult one. I think uh, they'll, they'll be obviously f putting all their eggs in overturning the Copa del Rey deficit. If they could finish this season a season of transition, which Coman keeps on emphasising, a season in which, you know, started so appallingly with the Messi fiasco, fiasco their president changed, etc. If they could end this season with a trophy, that would be a pretty good achievement. And yes, there are green, green shoots of recovery there. I think Pedri's played very well. Frankie de Jong's been much better. Usman Dembele looks like he's finally finding some form as well. Mingueza, Araujo. There's been... There's been reasons to be cheerful for Barcelona fans. You're just you're looking for more from Griezmann still. He uh, even though he's been better, I feel like Coutinho still hasn't really worked out. He's the one I'd probably be looking to offload this summer, despite his injury issues. So there's still plenty for any Barcelona manager who comes in in their in tray. But some pleasing domestic results. I did see uh, this morning that Juan Laporta said that they are considering using, uh, trying to get Mikel Arteta mm, as their yes. new manager, which would be fascinating, to be honest. I don't know what he's really done to deserve that job <laughs> just yet, even though, you know, you know, some, shine, some signs of recovery at Arsenal too. But I feel like it's a, maybe a step too far at the moment. I mean, Henry, could you see Arteta stepping in for, for Koeman? It's funny, I read that as well. Um, what? I... Did he have history at Barcelona? I think he did come through some kind of He system, came through though. their academy, yeah. I yeah, think so. yeah. Um, I think it's too early for him. I don't think he's achieved enough of the Arsenal project. Um, I think maybe if he wins, does well in the Europa League, wins uh, another competition, then maybe there's more thought there. I wasn't a huge fan of Kerman before he went, but I think you've got to give credit to him. It's not an easy job, and I think he's doing a fairly reasonable job at the moment. But yeah, I, down the line, I wouldn't be shocked to see that happen. There we go. Henry's giving Coman a B minus. What would you rate him for this season? Get your thoughts in the comments down below. And let's move on to our final section. It's time for start of the week. Everyone's favourite section. This one comes in from Menez underscore 18 underscore. And it's Teo Hernandez. What went down with Teo? Big bad Teo this week, Henry. Ooh, both the Milan sides, you know, keeping up the race for that Serie A title. Inter obviously won 3-0 against Genoa early on Sunday, but then AC Milan responded to beat Roma 2-1 with away goals away from home with goals coming from Kessier, Rebic, and then Jordan Vera 2 getting one for Roma. Really beautiful goal that. Um, and that keeps the gap to four points at the top of Serie A. Big win considering Roma also knocking around the top four as well. Mm. Um if we look at kind of the AC Milan side, although he didn't play a role in either goal, Calabria did win the penalty after a sloppy tackle from Fazio. In my opinion, one of those which looks worse in slow motion, uh, the old yeah. VAR slow motion. Um, had Paulo Lopez's terrible clearance leading to Rebic's goals. That's his fifth in 16 Serie A games this term. But above all of them, the best player on the pitch was 23-year-old left-back Teo Hernandez. We're a huge fan of him on the channel here. 
Two tackles, one aerial dual win, six dribbles, four key passes and one shots, doing everything right, both ends of the pitch. And yeah, Terry Hernandez, like we said, dude, we just love this guy, don't we? Yeah, I mean, he, he's ridiculous. And it's mental that he hasn't had a full cap for any nation. I think he's eligible to represent Spain. And of course, he's a former French under 20 international. But I would be looking to get him in my squads for the March internationals this month uh, for, for either side, really, and get this guy capped. Even though France have so many, you know, great left backs already. Ferlon Monde, they've of course got his brother Luca Hernandez as well. And, and Spain have got Jose Gaia, and I'm sure I'm missing someone out. Regulon as well. I get this guy capped as soon as possible because he's going right to the very top. He's mm. contributed eight league goals this season. Four goals and four assists in 21 league games. I think only Zlatan, Rafa Liao, Kessi and Kaohanoglu and Kessi, mainly penalties, have contributed more. And his numbers are just quite simply fantastic. 2.6 tackles and interceptions, 1.4 shots, 1.6 key passes and 2.5 dribbles per 90. He's operating at 0.33 expected goals and assists per 90. For context, Robertson in the Premier League, who started the season very well, has had a little dip recently, 0.26. So I think it's fair to say that Teo Hernandez has been the best left back in the world this season, only this season. Obviously, if you take into account 2020, I think Andy Robertson was much better, Alfonso Davies too, but this season alone, from September to now, Teo Hernandez, I think, is quite clear. Uh, he's also second for passes into the penalty area, third for progressive passes, and third for tackles and interceptions in the man squad. He's also third for distance carried with the ball in the entirety of Italy. I think only Rodrigo De Paul and Ferrari from um, Sassuolo <laughs> have carried the ball further, and that's just what's mo most notable when you watch him. He's so comfortable running with the ball at high speeds, he's very quick, he's very powerful, and he's just incredibly difficult to stop. He's just like an absolute steam train down that left uh, left wing for Milan. And now that £19 million move from Real Madrid in July 2019 is just looking like quite simply one of the bargains of the last decade. Uh, another transfer mistake from uh, from Real Madrid with another youngster, but well done to AC Milan for getting it over the line and, and a massive, massive win. I feel like with Inter's current form, it's going to be really difficult to overturn that deficit, but all Milan can do after a bit of shaky form recently in Syria is just keep those wins coming. Mm -hmm. um, although I did, I did hear that Zlatan picked up a slight groin injury in the first half. I think he managed to play on, but that would be something they'll be a little bit worried for. It was good to see Tomori as well start alongside Kier at the back with Romagnoli not in the best of form in 2021. So plenty for Milan to be happy about. But guys, that's all we've got time for on ERU for this week. What did you guys think of the show? Let us know what you guys thought of our story, result and star of the week. And Henry, if they've enjoyed this, what should they go and watch now? Because you put out a very special bit of content on EFD over the weekend, didn't you? I did, I did. Thank you for mentioning I right. If Please do go check out our Why West Africa is producing so much talent. Uh, a lot of research went into it. I felt like I was back at university with all the research <laughs> that uh, went into it. Lots of long essays I had to read. But uh, yeah, a lot of time and effort went into it. And I'd really appreciate it if you all go went and gave it support. Absolutely. It's an absolute cracker. Go and show it some love. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. See you later.